Hey there, my fellow lunatics. Dakin the Mad here, and welcome to The Madhouse. Today we are going to talk about Core Keeper. This is a survival adventure game being made by Swedish gaming company Pugstorm and published by British studio Fireshine. At the time of this recording, Core Keeper is still in early access, so anything said here can be subject to change by official release. And if there are any changes worth noting, I'll leave them in the description or in a pinned comment below. The purpose of this video is to go over the basics of the game, including some known themes, storylines, and gaming mechanics. And I'm going to assume that people watching this video are either those who have not yet bought the game and want to get an understanding of it before making their purchase, or you already have the game, loaded it up, and immediately got frustrated and confused as to what you're supposed to be doing. As far as survival games go, Core Keeper is rather mild. Other survival games like Ark or Green Hell, The Forest, etc., they have some really brutal survival requirements and players expect to die constantly at the beginning. Core Keeper is much gentler, easing you into the more deadly parts of the game. You're not going to die of hunger or thirst in Core Keeper, though you do get debuffs if you don't keep your food meter filled. So you can't just ignore it. The environment itself isn't going to kill you, but you could still get swarmed by cavelings or crushed under a giant slime. Core Keeper takes a lot of the exploration and adventure aspects from games like Deep Rock Galactic or Terraria for their inspiration. While their survival aspects and general graphical style are more inspired by Stardew Valley, then there's the base building and world destruction elements, which fall more in line with Minecraft style. Plus, there's an element of mechanization that's much more like Factorio. Core Keeper takes the best parts of each of these games and kind of blends it all together to create something new and different. Whether you're a hardcore adventurer with a desire to kill everything as quickly as possible, a relaxed casual gamer who wants to sip tea and lose a few hours building the perfect barn for your animals, or a hyper-focused engineer with a desire to automate the game entirely into easy mode, Core Keeper has something for everyone. When we first load up the game, we're greeted with some calming music, and several options. I want to go over a bit here in the menu before we start the game, as the first thing that you should ask yourself is, is my computer a potato? Despite being a pixel game, Core Keeper can actually be a bit resource intensive as it has a lot of dynamic lighting effects. So when you click on settings, the things you're gonna wanna look at are display settings, graphic settings, gameplay settings. Vibration, screen shakes, if you have nausea problems, these can be very helpful. In here in the gameplay settings, I also want to mention the seasonal override. You're not going to really worry about this too much when you're brand new and first starting, but keep remember this because this is where you can actually change the seasonal events so you don't have to actually it doesn't have to actually be christmas for you to do the christmas events valentine's day the anniversary etc you can change the season here in the settings but your display settings will help as well as these graphic settings which allow you to change the light quality and the ambiance all of this is very helpful, especially if you don't have a very powerful computer. If you do have a stronger PC, don't worry about it. You can skip past all of this. If you're one of those people that really needs to redesign or customize their general layout for their keyboard, their mouse, their controller, whatever it is that they're using. This game has a lot of customization options, especially if you aren't using a standard kind of keyboard. This is really helpful for people who have accessibility issues, being able to customize to the level that this game allows you to customize. And they are constantly listening to feedback and adding more customization. Equipment loadout, this is a good one to remember. You'll need it in the future, but you're not gonna worry about it as a newbie. But just remember this, someday you're gonna wanna turn these on. I like to set it to shift one through three. 
it's not set by default. When you start your first game, you'll be presented with a menu asking you to select your world. New players will see a bunch of empty world slots. Click on the first one to create your world. Name it whatever you want, give it whatever icon that you find pleasurable, and select the world type. There are four world types. Casual, basically easy mode, best for players who want to focus on building, but still want to experience the combat and general challenges the game has to offer. Standard. This is your normal world, your basic game world. No modifications to behavior. This is the default setting and what I recommend for new players. Hard. Double the HP for monsters, double the damage for monsters. This is a significant challenge for new characters and for new players. I don't recommend it for your first world. And creative. This is a blank game world where you can open a menu and spawn most any item that you want. This is perfect for players who just want to build creatively with elaborate structures and settings without having to deal with spending hours actually acquiring everything. Unfortunately, not everything is in creative mode right now, and there are certain things that are in the main world that you can't create in creative mode, and that's something that they're hoping to add in the future. So as things go on and the game develops more, you can expect creative mode to gain more features and more options. After you create your first world, you will be asked to select your first character. You're going to want to click on one of the blank character slots and select your character type. There are two character types, standard and hardcore. Hardcore characters can only die once and then they're automatically deleted. You're going to want a standard character. As you're going through the character creation, you'll notice that everything here in the character creation menu is cosmetic except the background. The background can actually have an effect on your gameplay. Now, none of the backgrounds are bad. However, some backgrounds are more useful than others. In my opinion, here are the best backgrounds. The Miner. This starts you off with a copper pickaxe right away. This makes the early mining much faster and easier, allowing you to spread out and explore a lot quicker. This is a major time saver. The Explorer. The Explorer starts you off with a small lantern and having the lantern light source that's automatically equipped that you don't have to craft and place like torches is so helpful. You aren't mining in the dark all the time. This is a huge quality of life upgrade and having it right at the very beginning is just very nice to have. The Ranger starts you off with a wooden bow. Personally, I recommend ranged over melee, especially for new players. You don't have a lot of hit points at the beginning and having some distance between you and the enemy is really useful. So starting the game with a ranged bow just makes your combat a lot easier. As you are exploring, you will find little X's on the ground. If you craft yourself a shovel, you can dig up those little X's. They have little treasures. When you dig those up, there's a chance that you might find a loyal egg. The loyal egg is a very useful item. It, when you incubate it, you can also check out my video on pets to learn all the details about how pet incubation works and all that. When you incubate the egg, you will get the subterrier, which is a melee uh, pet that guards you. So if you have the wooden bow from Ranger and then you manage to get yourself the Subterrier, you'll find that you are very protected, especially in the early game. Now, if you are someone that just prefers melee or you just want to be melee, go with Fighter because getting that copper sword right away pretty much puts you in a position where you can fight the first boss almost immediately. The skill bonuses that each background provides don't really matter. Three points of any skill, especially the first three points, are relatively easy to get. The little boost is nice, but it is not game changing. You are an explorer. You and your team are exploring a remote jungle when you stumble upon a large boulder with strange symbols carved into it.
when you touch the stone. It flares to life, its symbols and runes glowing an eerie blue. Suddenly, a flash of light, and you find yourself in a cave. Another stone, just like the one you saw, lays near you, but it is covered in roots. Touching it does nothing. You're trapped. All right, so you have created your first world and your first character. Now what? Well, first, you're going to want to clear out the area and get your bearings. So pressing tab will open up the inventory menu. Here we've got the small lantern that I mentioned earlier. I'm going to put that in my lantern slot. This is my inventory. Or this is my, my loadout is what it's called. It's where I can equip everything. This is my hotbar and then my inventory currently. You have three equipment loadouts that you can have going at any given time, like I mentioned in the settings menu part of the video. This is where you can set them up to hotkeys so that you can just automatically and quickly switch between them when you, I mean, it doesn't matter now, nothing's happening because they're all the same, but they are switching. Additionally, on this tab here, this is where all of your skills are. As you go up every five skill ranks here, you'll gain one skill point that you can spend here. Up here in the top left corner, you've got your health and you've got your food meter. So what we need to do is we need to clear things out a little bit here. You're gonna wanna start by just breaking wood. I'm gonna do this by left clicking. And you can break the wood that will destroy, uh, if I do this, you see how it breaks um, over the core. If you want it gone, you can break that. But if you want to keep this vine kind of look on the core, you're going to need to keep one tile of wood here. You can regrow the wood if you do break it all. So if I break this or this, but this one right here will not regrow if you break it. You can regrow the others though. Check out my one of my five things that you may have missed about core keeper videos and I explain how to regrow it there. So once you've looked around and gathered up some wood, you'll notice that we have these three strange statues here. This says Glurch the Abominous Mass, and it has a crystal slot. This one here, Gorm the Devourer, and the Hive Mother. These are our first three bosses that we have to find and take care of. So right here on the left, when I open up my inventory, we also have the initial crafting menu. Here you can create a torch, wood pickaxe, wood shovel, the basic workbench and basic chests. First thing I'm gonna to wanna to do is create a basic workbench. I'm gonna create a wood pickaxe, and create a wood shovel. And I'm gonna create a few torches. You'll need them. You need to light things up, it's pretty dark in here. To place anything, it has to be within your hotbar. So I select my workbench, I'm going to go ahead and place it down. So here we've got our basic workbench. This is where we have the first things that we're going to need to get started with crafting. I'm going to go ahead, since I've got the wood, I'm going to go ahead and make myself some armor to help protect myself. And if you hold down shift and left click, it'll let you quickly equip the item. So now I've got armor on. That improves my defense. It improves my max health. And I definitely need it at the beginning like this. Let's go ahead and craft a sword too. Now, in order to make this furnace that we're going to want to make, we are going to need 20 dirt walls. So we equip our pickaxe and we start hitting walls. And if you'll notice, it's hard to see, but in the lower left-hand corner, there is an open area. You can kind of, kind of barely see it. Plus all of the sparkling stuff, the sparkling, this is ore. Here's our first creature. The Shroomling. Harvest this sparkling ore covered wall in order to gain the copper ore. All right, y'all, I just want to take two seconds to ask you to please hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. It does really help grow my channel. All right, enough shameless plugging, more video. When you find these wooden chests throughout the world, just break them at the very beginning 
they get you all sorts of really useful things like scrap parts and mechanical parts. But later on, you are going to want to save some because if you use your shovel, you right click and you'll get the actual crate itself, which you can use as a decoration or place later and break at a later date and time. So as you're out here exploring, what I recommend doing, hit M by the way to open up your main map, is kind of exploring in a circle around your core and kind of widening out in a bit of a spiral shape, at least at the beginning. It gives you a general idea of what's directly around you and it will help you find the first boss much quicker because the first boss is actually relatively close and you'll know he's nearby when your screen starts to shake periodically. In case you're wondering, up here in the corner, these two numbers are your coordinates, your X and Y coordinates. And then this number in parentheses is how many tiles away your cursor currently is from the central core. Now your basics of combat are relatively simple. You left hand click to swing with your weapon. And many creatures are aggressive, some are not, like this orange slime is not aggressive. But as soon as I start swinging at it, it will start attacking me. Now, if you are melee like I am at the moment, the best thing to do is to come in close, swing, and then back away. Come in close, swing, and back away. That will help you, especially at the beginning, kill as many as possible without really getting hit. Now, if you're using ranged combat, you're just going to want to stand as far away as possible and just keep moving steadily away from the creature. Now, you don't want to stay too far away because if they don't attack back, then they will eventually heal and you don't want them healing. Okay, we've got enough dirt for a furnace. Go ahead and craft the furnace and place that. And now we'll put our copper in here and get that started. We also managed to find a lively egg. This will get us an owl pet. These are really useful, so it's nice to have one of these. As you're mining, your pickaxe may break, especially when you've got a wood or a copper one. Dirt and a lot of these earlier walls can be broken with your bare hands. You don't actually need the pickaxe. The pickaxe just decreases the amount of hits that you have to take in order to break the wall. So at this point, I've barely started exploring. I just started moving out in my little spiral pattern. And I, when I got over here, I started to have screen shakes. And so I started exploring a little bit further to the west. And right here is where I found the first slime boss. So we're going to talk about how to beat him in just a second. But first, I want to go over a few more basics of what you want to do right at the very beginning. Because as you can see, I am starving. I, my movement speed is decreased. My health is decreased. My damage is decreased. These are the debuffs that you get from starvation. Now, I do have mushrooms and I do have some food rations so I can get my food back up here a little bit. But I need to do something about starving in general. So what I need to do is I need to clear out a little bit of space here so that I can create my first farm. Okay, so I've dug out a little space for myself. I've got some water here so that I've got access to be able to fill up my watering can. And I have found some more seeds. Took forever. And what I'm gonna do is I've crafted a wooden hoe and I'm gonna right click to start hoeing the herb, to start tilling the ground and create an area for my crops to be. Then you right click to plant all of your seeds down. And finally over here, I'm just gonna go ahead and plant one root seed. I'm gonna water that root seed. And then you just water all of your crops one at a time. At the moment, there is not a faster way to do it. You will get a faster way as the game progresses. Now we just have to let this grow and we will have ourselves some crops, which we can then use to cook and get ourselves some food. 
Now this root seed here, this root seed is going to grow into a wood farm for us essentially. At the beginning, you're just going to want to plant a couple of these down so that you have wood growing near you so that you can always replenish your wood supply. But I want you to check out my video on how to build a wood farm because you're going to want to build that wood farm at some point before you defeat all three bosses so that you can get some decent wood production going. There are several really good reasons why. Okay, so I've got some bomb peppers and I've got some heart berries. And I'm just going to go ahead and place down my cooking pot, put in both, and it's going to go ahead and start combining. And you can put in different combinations of different crops as well as different fish that you can fish up to create various different foods. And the different combinations will provide you with different buffs and other benefits. So practice around, mix and match, and find your favorites. You will likely find Glurch, the first slime boss, rather quickly. He only spawns 65 tiles from the central core. This boss can definitely feel intimidating, especially at first, but he's actually rather simple. You just need to understand the basics of how the fight works. As you can see here, Glurch is just jumping up and down, and that is the majority of what he does. It's the slime around him that slows you down that causes most of your problems. Now his slam attack when he jumps on top of you will do a lot of damage, so you do want to try to avoid getting hit by him. This is why ranged is the method that I usually prefer for people, because then you don't have to run in, hit him a couple of times, and then dodge back out. But he essentially is the exact same tactic that you would use fighting melee for any other normal slime, just he's bigger. He also doesn't have nearly as many hit points as you would think. Now right now, I don't have that many hit points either, and I don't have a lot of armor. I've managed to find the Swift Feather, which if you manage to get your hands on this, this is a really excellent early game item. It gives you a nice dash, which can help you get away, especially if you've been slowed down by the slime during this fight. And I have managed to find the Ring of Stone. This really won't help me much in this fight. I managed to incubate a pet. And so this pet is going to give me a 2% chance to do triple damage. You might have something totally different if you manage to incubate yourself a pet by this point as well. You can get the lively eggs in um, random chests that you break. So you'll probably find one of these eggs while exploring. I've also got a wooden bow at this point. And I've got a copper sword, so I can do either melee or range if I need to. We're going to do this fight with range, just so that I can show you what it's like at first. Glurch is a relatively straightforward boss. And just keep shooting him and moving. Just keep firing and moving. And he does eventually get faster when you get him a little bit below half health. See, there he goes. Now he's in his super fast mode. He's going to move a lot faster now. This is why ranged is a little bit better because you can keep moving and keep firing at the same time. And that's it. I had a th four ranged combat. Wooden armor and a wood bow. And we were able to defeat him with ease. When you defeat the boss, you will get several important things. You'll get a bunch of random items. In this case, I got two Uzi eggs, which are fine, I guess. But you get the Glurch Eye and you get the Slime Oil. The Slime Oil is going to help you bring this little NPC guy here over to your base. That kind of the Slime Oil lures him to base. Glurch's eye is important because it is the crystal that goes into the statue. So we just open up the statue's little icon here, pick up the crystal and put it into the crystal slot. And that unlocks the Gorm the Devourer scanner, the Hive Mother scanner, and the Slime Sword. So these scanners are really nice because they'll literally tell you exactly where the boss is. So if you don't want to spend time trying to find them, craft up these scanners. It's five ancient gems and five mechanical parts each. It may take a while to get that at the beginning, but once you craft that up, you will know exactly where the bosses are located. With one boss down, 
there are still two more needed to bring life to your dormant core. It's time to start exploring outward. I recommend picking a direction and just mining in a straight line. Bring bridges with you. You want to find the clay caverns. If you find the forgotten ruins, turn around, head back to the core and go in the exact opposite the direction. The ruins and the caverns each surround half of the dirt biome. Tin is the resource you want to get your hands on as quickly as possible. Tin lets you craft crude drills. Make an automation table and an electronics table, craft eight drills, a switch, and three wires. Then you need to find a copper boulder. Chances are you found at least one in your exploration. Set up your drills around the copper boulder and get that copper flowing. Repeat this with a tin boulder and again in the Forgotten Ruins with an iron boulder as soon as you find one. Walking around everywhere can be a pain, especially when you have all these boulders scattered everywhere. The reason I recommend the copper boulder first is so that you can start crafting rails and a minecart. Begin building out your railway system to all the important locations, your boulders, the biomes where you're exploring, bosses, or, or, or anything else that matters to you. The rails act as an early game fast travel system. Each workbench offers you a guide to your early game progression. The wooden workbench leads to the copper workbench, which leads to tin, which leads to iron. In each workbench are additional crafting tables that continue to expand your capabilities. This game is one that is designed for a player to take their time. As you unlock each new workbench, you dig out more area around your core and you build yourself structures to store everything that you've learned. You can be as basic or as elaborate as you desire. Build storage rooms with color-coded chests or a pen for hatching pet eggs. Make yourself a bedroom or a garden. Build individual houses for your NPC friends. Check out my video on wood farming as well for tips on how to build a quality wood farm as it can easily be done with crude drills. Expand your crop farm and make sure that there's a wash basin nearby. It'll provide water for your uh, water bucket. Ultimately, you'll want to equip yourself in a full set of iron armor and have either a tin axe, a broken handle, or an iron sword if you're melee. You'll either want an iron bow or a fireball staff if you're ranged. Your rings and necklace can be whatever you've been lucky enough to find. There are many good ones. If you want to power level yourself a little bit, Check out my skill guide for crafting for tips on how to get your crafting to 100 before you've beaten any bosses. With an 85 plus crafting skill, you can make polished jewelry. Polished jewelry such as the polished copper cross necklace and the polished gold crystal ring are used even in end game builds and both can be acquired at the beginning of the game just by crafting a lot of wooden bridges and making a jewelry workbench from the iron workbench. But what happens after the first three bosses have been defeated and the core is activated? And what's with the scarlet bars that some of your crafting stations have required? Where do you get that? Well, that's a story for another guide video. And I think that just about wraps it up for today's video. I hope you enjoyed yourself and until next time, stay crazy.